Last night I was on a plane with a three-year-old and I was forced to sing Puff the Magic Dragon for about <laughs> half an hour straight. So <laughs> there will be no singing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so I think I got stuck in the star formation session because someone didn't actually look at my abstract. Um, I'm not going to talk about star formation really at all here. I think it was just they saw my name more like, ah, what is this guy going to talk about? I'm going to actually, this is going to be my like observational talk. I'm not actually going to do any observations, but I'm going to try and make sense of observations because occasionally the observers need us. They need our help. They, they don't know what to do with their data, and so they need theorists to come in and tell them what it means. And so that's what I'm going to try and do in this talk, now that I've pissed off half the audience. But you're, at least you're awake. Um, <laughs> all right, so I'm going to, in this talk, try and talk about how do we make sense of the observables that we use to trace star formation. All right, so here's the problem. What we would really like to be able to do is the following. All right, we'd like to measure H1 and H2 surface densities and volume densities. We'd like to do it in a bunch of galaxies. We'd like to measure the star formation rates in the corresponding areas or volumes. And we'd like to plot the relationship between the two. All right, in some sense, that's what the Kennecott law is all about. That's what you're really attempting to do when you make a Kennecott law, is you're attempting to make a plot like this. Now, that's what we'd like to do. The problem is we really can't. What we can actually do is more like this. Well, OK, we can measure 21 centimeter line. And to trace the molecular gas, well, you can't measure H2 directly. So you go use a proxy like CO. And you can't generally get the entire CO excitation ladder. So at low redshift, you get, say, J of 1 to 0 or 2 to 1. Whereas if you're at high redshift, you maybe get some higher J line, like J4 or higher. And you then attempt to convert that into a molecular gas. And of course, if you're at high redshift, you can't see the 21 centimeter line at all. All right, you maybe, if you, you know, if the telescope allocation committee gods were kind to you, manage to get some high density tracer that tells you about H2 at higher density, something like, say, HCN or HCO plus. Usually you don't have that. All right, you can't measure star formation directly usually, so you measure some proxy for it. Like, for example, ionizing radiation, and of course you can't measure the ionizing radiation directly either, so you go and measure some proxy for that, like, for example, H alpha or O3 emission. All right, and then you maybe have FUV emission or you have infrared luminosity, and you use that to infer a star formation rate. All right, and then you take the hodgepodge you've been able to assemble, you throw it down on a plot, and you, pl and you pray. So that's what we actually do. This is like you know, the ideal scientific method. This is science as it's actually practiced. All right, so at every step of this procedure, interpretation is required. And those interpretations can get you in trouble. So here's the gallery of how we get in trouble. All right, so let's start with the CO luminosity. I have here two plots from two fairly recent papers, one by Reinhard Genzel, one by Emmanuel Adati. And what's plotted on the x-axis is CO luminosity versus FIR luminosity, which is a proxy for star formation rate. All right, and don't worry about exactly what the different colored dots are, what the samples are. The point is simply that, so here's the correlation between CO and IR luminosity. And you know, if you were an astronomer and you looked at this, you'd probably go fit a power law to it. This is Genzel. This is the exact same data, exactly the same data. But the x-axis here has now been shifted from LCO to massive H2. All right, and in the process, this immense bimodality has appeared between starbursts and disks. And that bimodality, you could maybe, if you squinted really hard, convince yourself there's one there in the original data. But the vast majority of it is simply because a different conversion factor between CO luminosity and H2 mass has been used for these galaxies here versus these galaxies here. Now, that is, in fact, maybe plausible. And there are good reasons to think that the CO to H2 conversion factor shouldn't be constant. But you should look at that data and that data and get extraordinarily nervous. All right, so that's problem number one. Now, problem number two, and that's something these guys have sort of you know, largely ignored, is for their LCO, this is LCO 1 to 0. That's not actually what was measured for most of these. All right, and that's because the CO 1 to 0 line, if you are beyond redshift about 1, shifts into a really obnoxious part of the atmosphere. And it gets very hard to observe. And that's what's illustrated here. 
All right, so here is a function of redshift. The red lines here are showing you where the various CO lines lie. All right, and you'll notice that at redshift, all right, so CO1 to 0, you can do from a bunch of ground-based things at redshift 0. All right, you get to redshift uh, 1, and there's nothing there. You can't observe that line. All right, so what was really done in that data is some higher JCO line was observed, and then it was converted into a CO1 to 0 line. All right. Now, this is, in fact, all of the high-Z CO detections we have circa 2013 when this plot was made by Curley and Walter. All right, and notice the color coding here. The red is quasars for sort of normal star-forming galaxies. All right, that's blue. There's really not a lot of data there. All right, and what there is certainly doesn't cover the full CO ladder. So you're going to have maybe one high JCO line, maybe two, and now you want to convert that to a, a CO1 to zero to put it on the same data, on the same plot as the local data. All right, and what you do is you say, well, I will use a template spectral line energy distribution to do that. This is why that is bad. All right, so here's a plot of CO spectral line energy distributions for the very, very small sample where we actually do have a bunch of lines. And I want you to focus on the purple and the red. All right, so the purple is the measured CO spectral line energy distribution for SMM, some telephone number. If you squint hard, you can see what number it is. The red is for the cloverleaf quasar. And I point those two out because these two galaxies have exactly the same star formation rate. All right, so if you just say, well, I will use the star formation rate to infer a CO spectral line energy distribution, all right, and then you went out and you measured COJ equals 5, well, how exactly, which of these templates were you planning on using that to, to down-convert that to your J of 1 to 0? People go ahead and do something, but that doesn't mean it's right. All right, so that's your second problem. All right, the other side of the ledger, the star formation rate, is also a problem. All right, and, and here is another one of these plots that if you know what you're looking at, should terrify you. Um, the x-axis here, it's the... It's the surface density of H alpha emission. Here it's the total rate of H alpha emission. And the y axis is the ratio of H alpha emission to far ultraviolet emission. Now, these are two different proxies for the star formation rate. All right, so if they're both good proxies for the star formation rate, well, then this ratio should basically scatter about unity. And at reasonably high star formation rates, it does, and that's sort of nice. But then you'll notice that there's this systematic trend. H alpha star formation rates are systematically below FUV star formation rates once the H alpha star formation rate drops below about a tenth of a solar mass per year. Which of them is right and why? So that should, too, make you nervous. All right, so I am going to attempt to allay your fears regarding some of these plots. All right, so let's start with the CO line emission. All right, so here's my 30-second tutorial in what a CO line is actually getting you. All right, why is CO a good proxy for molecular gas? All right, and the key idea is that low JCO is almost always optically thick. All right, and what that means is that if you look at line center, you're staring at a brick wall. You just get to see the surfaces of the molecular clouds. You don't get to see through them or into them. All right, it's like looking at a wall. So how does that tell me anything about the mass of gas I'm looking at? Well, the emission I'm going to see, the frequency integrated luminosity, or equivalently, since we're talking about radio here, the velocity integrated brightness temperature, is simply the kinetic temperature of the gas multiplied by the velocity dispersion of the gas. And the velocity dispersion of the gas is related to the mass via the virial theorem. So I can write down the virial theorem. Here's the velocity dispersion. I can write this way. This alpha vir is the virial ratio. It's a measure of how virialized the gas is. Value is much bigger than 1 means super virial. Order 1 means virial. All right, and I can equivalently rewrite that as a column density and an alpha and a volume density. All right, and so if I just take this and plug it into here, what you get is that the CO intensity, which is what I actually get to measure, scales like the column density times the infamous XCO factor, where this X factor depends on the virial ratio, the volume density, and the kinetic temperature of the gas. And that is constant if this combination of things is constant. Now, if you go look at the Milky Way, this combination of things is about constant. Molecular clouds in the Milky Way all have roughly the same volume density, on average, all have virial parameters of about 1, and all have about the same gas kinetic temperature. And you can measure those things directly. And you can check using 
alternate methods of me measuring the column density, and this works reasonably well. All right, but are you willing to bet that all of these things are the same if you go look at some high redshift galaxy? I'm not. All right, so can we do better? And the answer is yes, and this is work that I've done with Desikam Narayanan. All right, so let's say, let's try and do the problem theoretically. Let's say we've got a high redshift galaxy. What CO emission would emerge from it? So here's what we've done. We've taken a large library of simulations of both isolated and merging galaxies, and we've done mergers from one-to-one -one major mergers to glancing minor mergers. We've done galaxy disks that are isolated and are set up to look like Z of zero galaxies, to look like giant clumpy disks. We've got a library of order 100 simulations. In each of these simulations, we've taken a, a bunch of snapshots and we've post-processed them with sunrise to calculate the dust temperature distribution throughout the galaxy. We've also computed the chemical state of the gas in order to figure out where the gas is molecular and thus where there will be CO that's capable of emitting using equilibrium chemical models. And then we've taken the dust temperatures and in the places where there's molecular gas, we've used a code I wrote called despotic which stands for derive the energetics and spectra of optically thick interstellar clouds. Take that massive. Um, <laughs> which so does the sort of self-consistent calculation of the gas temperature, the CO excitation ladder, and the emergent CO spectrum. And you actually have to solve all of those problems simultaneously because they're all related to one another. All right, and so you run it through this big pipeline. And in the end, what you get is a map of the CO emission from the galaxy. So here are just some examples. All right, so here is a map of CO intensity for an isolated Z of zero disk. Here is a map for a one-to-one -one major merger. Um, these two are on different color scales, and just for comparison, this here is that galaxy using the same color bar as this one. All right, and in addition to getting the CO emission, we can now actually say what the CO X factor is. That is, we know from the simulation what the true molecular gas column density along every line of sight is. And so we can say, what is XCO? And what you find is that the CO emission, all right, so XCO is indeed bigger here than here. All right, and that's exactly what the various indirect observational proxies have been suggesting for a long time. But here we can actually get it out from the theory. All right, and what's driving this difference is pretty simple. All right, the gas in the major merger is significantly warmer, first of all. It's got a higher kinetic temperature. And, and what's driving that is the starlight heating the dust, and the dust is then collisionally coupling with the gas because the density is high enough that the dust and gas temperatures get locked together. So the kinetic temperature is higher. The virial ratio is also higher. Because in the major merger, the gas is super virial. It's moving around not in the velocity dispersion of the local gravitationally bound molecular cloud like in the Milky Way, but at a velocity dispersion set by something like the merger velocity. The density is higher, too, and that goes in the opposite direction, but it's not quite enough to counteract the other two effects. All right. Now, of course, that's all great, but you need to have this in terms of observables if it's going to be useful. So we can then ask. What does XCO correlate with that you can actually observe? And it turns out the thing it correlates with best is just the total intensity of CO emission. There's a lot of scatter, but you can see here's XCO and here's WCO. There is a correlation between the two. Things with lower CO intensities have systematically higher XCOs. All right, and you can make a best fit. And you can see there's going to be a lot of scatter on a galaxy by galaxy basis. But if you then take the data, and instead of using the bimodal XCO where I say this is a merger and I give it this XCO and this is not and I give it this XCO, you just use this formula. Here's the same data set I showed you before and lo and behold, there's no bimodality. Here's gas surface density, here's molecular gas surface density, here's star formation rate surface density, all fits on one nice plot. No more bimodality, it's an artifact. Yep. Now, all right, that was for CO1 to 0. How about higher J lines? Now, here it gets a little more complicated because you have to worry about several other things. First of all, you have to worry about the gas temperature distribution. All right, and that's because you have to be warm enough to excite the line in the first place. All right, so just to walk you through what's going on here, here I am showing you for two different simulations the joint density and temperature probability distribution function for the molecular gas. 
So the contours are just showing where's the typical molecular material in terms of density and temperature. And so this is a Milky Way-like galaxy. The molecular material is all around 10 Kelvin at a density of a few hundred. Here is a major merger, all right, and the molecular material is all at 100 Kelvin at a density of 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5. All right, and for the high J lines, you need to get above these dashed lines, right? So these dashed lines, say this dashed red line, is the temperature you need to excite the J of 5 line of CO. You don't get much of that in the Milky Way because there's just not enough warm molecular gas. Here, all the molecular gas is warm enough to excite J of 5. You need to be dense enough that you can thermally populate the higher J states. All right, the critical densities go up as you go to higher J. So in the Milky Way, not only don't you have warm enough stuff to excite this red J of 5 state, you're not dense enough to thermally populate it. Whereas here, well, you're still not quite dense enough to thermally populate it. You'll be subthermal, but you're closer. All right, and of course, you have to have enough material that the line becomes opaque. All right, so what you can do is you can, again, take our library of simulations, and you can try and ask, given the density and temperature PDFs we measure, what will you actually get? All right, and here is a comparison to the observations. All right, so let me just walk you through this plot. X-axis is J of the upper state, and the Y-axis is the intensity of a particular line normalized to the intensity of the 1 to 0 line. And this is a set of all the galaxies for which 1 to 0 lines exist at redshift 1 and higher. And you'll notice it's not a very large list. All right, the points here are showing you the measurements. The blue lines are just a curve of J squared, and that's what you would get if the gas were all at a constant temperature and at a very high, de well, we're all at a constant temperature that is much higher than the temperature required to excite these lines and dense enough that all of the levels were thermally populated. So you don't expect to go above the J squared line. That's the sort of really hot, dense case. That's the, therm pu that's the purely hot thermal case. The dashed lines are the predictions of our model. All right, and what you can see is that the dashed lines go beautifully through the data. All right, and so we're able to calculate from first principles the CO spectral line energy distribution. Now, what's the input? What's the observable input we use for this? Well, it turns out the star formation rate is the thing that correlates best with the spectral line energy distribution. So if you know the star formation rate per unit area, that's key, it's per unit area, you can, in fact, predict this CO spectral line energy distribution pretty well. And thus, you can use that to down-convert the J of 5 line that you could actually measure into a J of 1 line and put it on the same plot as the local galaxies where you can only measure J of 1 and you can't measure J of 5. All right, now, how about higher, how about other lines? How about things like HCN and CO, higher critical density lines? All right, these are ways of getting at gas that's cold but dense, which is what people get excited about for star formation. All right, now, how do you expect the luminosities of those lines to scale with things? Well, the star formation rate you expect to be a fixed fraction of the mass per freefall time. That's the recipe everyone's implementing. So the star formation rate, if I've got a fixed volume, should go like the density of gas to the 3 halves power. Now, let's think about how line emission will vary if I take a fixed volume of gas, but I just change the mean density. Well, that depends on what the critical density for the line is. And so here's my illustrated example. Here's gas with a certain mean density. All right, here's my density distribution. All right, and let's say I'm looking at a line with a low critical density, something like CO1 to 0. So basically, all the mass is dense enough to excite this line. All right, now let's imagine I just take the density of this gas and I increase it by a factor of 10. What will happen? Well, the star formation rate will go up by a factor of 10 to the 3 halves power. The line luminosity, on the other hand, will simply go up as n to the first power. And that's because I already was seeing all the material. If I've got 10 times as many atoms, I just get 10 times as many photons. So the line luminosity for a low critical density just goes like n to the first power. What if I now pick a high critical density line, something like HCN, which has a critical density of about 10 to the 5? Well, all right. Now I'm only seeing the tail of the density distribution. If I increase the mean density by a factor of 10, the luminosity will go up by way more than a factor of 10. I'll have 10 times as many atoms, 
but a much larger fraction of them will be at density is high enough to emit. And so I will get a line luminosity that scales as n to some power p, where p is bigger than 1 and has an exact value that depends on how n and n critical compare to one another. So I predict that the star formation rate, or the IR luminosity, its proxy, should go as L line to some power Q, where Q will be about three halves for low critical density lines, and will be more like one to something like that for higher critical density lines. Here's a plot of CO luminosity versus FIR luminosity, and that's a slope of about 1.5. Here, I've changed this CO to HCN, and that's a slope of one. And that's exactly what you see. All right, let's move on. Well, I'm going to skip the next steps. I'm instead going to talk about, can we make sense of what the hell is going on with ionization-based tracers of star formation rate, the other side of the ledger? All right, and, and here is the problem. And this is something that probably you high redshift people don't need to worry about too much unless you're going in after very small objects. But it's a huge problem for people who study local galaxies or who want to do spatially resolved observations of star formation where the regions they're looking at do not have star formation rates much higher than about a solar mass per year. And the problem is that when you go to lower star formation rates than that, you have to remember stars are not a continuous medium. They are not peanut butter. They are marbles. They come in discrete units. And that has a big effect on the observable ionizing emission. And just to emphasize that, here's the result of just drawing star clusters from a star cluster mass function, the one we observe in the local universe, for a given specified star formation rate. And here's at 100 solar masses per year. And here's the star formation rate just averaged over one mega year intervals. And you see, the star formation rate averaged over 100 mega year intervals is 100 solar masses per year. It's exactly what you put in. Here's one solar mass per year, and you're starting to see there's some jaggedness. Here's a tenth of a solar mass per year, and it's getting more and more jagged as I go down, and that's simply because stars and star clusters are finite objects, and when I draw them from the distribution, they form at a given time, not continuously. And this fluctuation over million year time scales drives a corresponding fluctuation in the ionizing luminosity. So I, together with a bunch of UCSC grad students, uh, Robert De Silva and Michele Fumagalli, wrote this code, Stochastically Lighting Up Galaxies, or SLUG, that does finite sampling from the IMF. And I'm going to skip and from the cluster mass function. I'll skip through this diagram and can actually correctly solve this problem. So let me give you the answer. Let me skip past the methods and give you the answer. Suppose that I have a given true star formation rate. I can then just generate a bunch of galaxies forming stars at that rate and ask, what's the distribution of luminosities I get? And that's what's plotted here. The x-axis is star formation rate. The y-axis is the star formation rate I would infer using the instantaneous ionizing luminosity. All right, and the black dashed line is a one-to-one -one line. And what you can see is that there's a very large amount of scatter at low star formation rates. At high star formation rates, you know, I might be off by half a dex. At low star formation rates, I can be off by three dex. And that's just because I might catch the galaxy at an instant when its last O star formed five million years ago. Or I might catch it at an instant when its last O star formed yesterday. And the difference between those two is many orders of magnitude in ionizing luminosity. The scatter is smaller for FUV and bolometric. So now I can do a statistics problem. Given these distributions of luminosity given star formation rate, what I would like to know is given that I measured a certain ionizing luminosity, what should I infer about the distribution of star formation rates? And this is a statistics problem. It can be done with a technique called, called implied conditional regression, which Robert De Silva taught me about. And the idea is, the joint distribution of star formation rate and luminosity can be written as the probability that you had some star formation rate multiplied by the probability of getting a certain luminosity given that that was your star formation rate. It's a fairly obvious statement. This we can get from whatever our prior probability distribution on star formation rate is. This we get from slug simulations. But I can equally well decompose this joint 2D PDF the other way. I can decompose it into the probability of getting a certain luminosity multiplied by the probability of the star formation rate given that luminosity, and this is the thing I want. 
All right, so I just do long division. And I say the probability of, that the star formation rate has a certain value, given data, given that I've measured some luminosity with some uncertainty, is simply this joint 2D PDF multiplied by the probability that the luminosity is whatever given my measurement. All right, and that basically is a fancy way of saying I'm going to take this plot and instead of slicing it vertically, I'm going to slice it horizontally. All right, but of course, the nice thing about this is I can do it in many dimensions. So here's the answer. Here is the probability if I measured a star formation rate of 10 to the minus 3 solar masses per year based on the ionizing luminosity, here's the probability distribution of the true star formation rate. All right, now I'm out of time, so let me just summarize with how bad is it? All right, well, here's the scatter and here's the bias. That is, if you just do the most naive thing and say, here's my ionizing luminosity, here's the star formation rate, the scatter could be as much as half a dex at low star formation, at high star formation rates, but could be a full dex at lower star formation rates. And the systematic error could be as large as a dex also. That's not good. All right, so I will skip future work where we've come up with a better version of slug that does fully stochastic spectra, so you can actually now do this for other indicators like O3 by taking this data and piping it through cloudy. And we're working on a similar Bayesian tool to infer the properties of individual star clusters. But I will end there since I see the chairman standing up. You are at the highest risk when using, it's not the emission line so much as it's things that are linked to ionizing radiation. It's anything that is ultimately driven by the star's ionizing radiation. And the reason is that's what fluctuates the most because the stars that produce it have the shortest lifetimes. And it's basically, I mean, I can show you here, right? So here is a slug spectrum. Uh, so this is a stellar population synthesis on the slug of a two mega year old population. All right, and the black line is the median and the gray band is the 10th to 90th percentile. Here is at four mega years. And you see this, you know, several, you know, you know this, this large drop appears between two and four mega years as your most massive stars die. All right, so what that means is that if you're looking at something that's driven by anything to the left of that break, then if there's fluctuations in the stellar population on even three or four mega year time scales, there will be a very, that, there will be a correspondingly large fluctuation in your inferred star formation rate. If on the other hand, you're looking at something to the right of that break, non-ionizing photons, things are much, much less bad. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. The, the other indicators have their own problems. If you're interested in fluctuations on the star, if you're interested in measuring the star formation rate on three mega year time scales, then you have to use something like ionizing radiation as, as a proxy. All right, so it depends on what you're after. If you're after the average star formation rate on a 100 mega year time scale, ionizing tracers are probably not a good thing to use. If you really want to measure how many stars formed in the last mega year, well, ionizing tracers are all you can use. Mm -hmm. about the uh, H2 versus star formation rate that you showed. Mm -hmm. I wasn't quite sure. Um, yeah, I mean, you skipped over it yeah. fast. Does that have all of the high redshift, uh, the submillimeter galaxies and the quasars on it also, or is this just the BZKs? Uh, this is not just the BZKs, but it is the ones where you could measure a per unit area quantity, which I think cuts out a lot of the, this is a per unit area, right? right? So, 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 so I think that gets rid of the vast majority of like the quasar samples. They're not specifically excluded. And there are indeed some like, you know, in these papers, like, you know, in, in Genzel's 2010 paper, there are some sources that are quasars. But I think most of the quasars are not in this sample. So then to which extent do you feel, I mean, you said 
paid by no by modality and yes, there's no by modality. To which extent has that been? Uh, what, how much was that affected by missing those guys who are particularly extreme star versus who are quasars? Right. So if you if you instead went back to something like this. Right, well, where here you haven't cut on that. So there's also no, bi I mean, I would say that there's no bimodality here, right? I mean, if you just use the CO1 to zero, you don't see the bimodality. You only introduce it by putting in the bimodal XCO, which is wrong. So if you take this data set and you, so, so yeah, if you take this data set and you use the, the XCO, so the problem is you can't actually, I should back up, you can't actually use our fitting formula unless you can measure the CO's intense surface intensity. So you do need at least one pixel, right? So you can't use our fitting formula if you've got no spatial resolution. That said, I'd be amazed, you know, there's no bimodality even if you don't use our fitting formula. I, I don't think our continuous fitting formula would be likely to introduce one.